Hello, Pastor Carnell here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in the basement. Welcome to our Tuesday morning Bible class. This is the second to last Tuesday morning Bible class of this session. I know, it's been quite, uh, quite an adventure, hasn't it? Going, going through the first thousand years of the Christian church. Uh, hopefully, uh, even during the coronavirus thing, when you're watching this at home uh, on YouTube and on our Facebook, Hopefully this is still helpful for you in giving you a great overview of the first 10 centuries of Christian thought, doctrine, and practice. Uh, I, I really do pray that it's a blessing to you. We're all the way up to the year 850 right now, and we're looking at something that is commonly referred to as the Eucharistic controversy. The, the word Eucharist, of course, refers to Holy Communion, which is also the same thing as the Lord's Supper or the Sacrament of the Altar, as Lutherans often call it, Eucharist is from a Greek word that means to give thanks, and it's understanding that when Christians go up to the altar together, they're giving thanks for the communion that they have with one another in a horizontal sense, and also the communion they have with God the Father through the mediator Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit in a vertical sense. So this Eucharistic controversy is, uh, well, it's, it's uh, in the early Middle Ages, uh, some 800 years after the deaths of the apostles, uh, in the in the fifties, at least many of the apostles, uh, and and uh, it's it's really it's really quite interesting because the Eucharistic controversy kind of there was a resurgence of the debate in the Reformation in the sixteenth century, and these these two writers who are both monks, Redbertus uh, Pascasius, Redbertus of Corby, and Retromnus of Corby, okay, <laughs> kind of difficult. Confusing names, they both start with the letter R. To make things worse, they had a contemporary named Rabanus, uh, who is also a monk and a writer and a friend of, of Charlemagne's court. Just like these, these men were both friends with Charlemagne's court and his sons and grandsons. But anyways, um, these were writers at a monastery called Corby in northwestern France, outside of Amiens. Amiens. Uh, I'm not good at pronouncing French. And uh, there, was, there was a controversy that kind of exploded there, but didn't lead to any uh, exiles or excommunications or, or imprisonments or banishments, which is very surprising. You know, we've been over in the East recently. We've been near Constantinople. And every controversy there results in dismemberments and banishments and other things. But here at Corby, I guess these two guys just agreed to disagree, and they had a different understanding of the Lord's Supper. And... As I said, this kind of came back into prominence, this debate, uh, what, some, some 700 years later, seven to 800 years later after this, during the Reformation. And these two men basically represent the two, position, two, two poles of the position on the Eucharist. We could say that the very literalistic uh, transubstantiation view and the symbolic, spiritual, mystical view. And Lutherans ended up taking a position kind of between them, behind them, in front of them. In some way, uh, the Lutheran position is a kind of a kind of a fusion of these of these early medieval views. Um, by the way, I should say this is our second to last Bible study of the year. I don't know if I said that already. Next week, we're going to be looking at the apocalyptic uh, the apocalyptic opinions in the 900s leading up to the year 1000, because a lot of different Christian writers believed that the world was about to end in the year 1000. They thought that was completing the 1000 years of the church of the end times and that Christ would return and uh, finally defeat the devil. And so there's a lot of interesting apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic stuff going on in the church, but that'll be next week. Um, sorry, that was on my mind. So uh, Rod Baroness was the abbot of the monastery of Corby. The abbot is the father figure, right? He's the leader, the the president, if you will, of the monastery. And around the year 831, he wrote what is generally considered now the first full-length book devoted to the Lord's Supper in the West, okay? So up until 850, different church fathers talked about the Eucharist all the time, obviously. Uh, there were treatises written on the church's mystagogy, that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the, 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 mystical sacraments in the church and the way that the church conducts worship and initiation and other things. But Rodbertus was really the first, the first theologian to devote an entire treatise on the topic of the Lord's Supper, explaining exactly what is happening, how is it happening, and why is it happening. 
And this treatise was extremely influential. It's also extremely dense. And it's rather it's kind of tricky. Um, and what's, what confuses matters more is that the way that Rab Baradis uses two words, namely truth and figure, truth, veritas, and figure, uh, are flipped in other writers. So Rautramnus talk it, it does not mean the same thing by truth and figure as Rod Baradis means. So it gets confusing. But Rod Baradis essentially uh, advocates what is today referred to as transubstantiation. What that means is that at the altar, by the power of the word, through the working of the Holy Spirit, when the priest consecrates the bread as our Lord's body and the wine as our Lord's blood, that bread and that wine is literally transformed into Christ's body and into Christ's blood. The same body and blood that were, that were, the same body and blood that were in the virgin, in the womb of Mary, the same body and blood that were nailed to the cross. And because that change actually occurs when Christians come together to celebrate the Eucharist, they are re-sacrificing that body and that blood. The priest, uh, with the verba, or the words of institution, is re-sacrificing. He's, he's reenacting the episode of the Last Supper and the episode at Calvary. That is happening again. The Lamb of God is once again offering himself on the altar for the sins of mankind, and Christians come up and receive him, and they eat him, even though uh, what even though the bread tastes like bread and the wine tastes like wine, and if you examine them, they would still be bread and wine, in, on the inside or interiorly or essentially, they have been transformed into the body and blood. Okay, so that's, Rebertus is really the first writer to explain this transubstantiation view that, is, that, is, that was then advocated later in the Middle Ages. And by the way, this is the view that took hold in the Roman Catholic Church and uh, ended up, I don't know, being uh, made part of the doctrine uh, later in the Middle Ages by people like, um, people like Thomas Aquinas and other important theologians. Peter Lombard, that's who I was going to say. Now, this view could be kind of, uh, oh, it can be a tricky view because what you have to avoid is a so-called Capernitic understanding of the Lord's Supper. So in John chapter 6, in Capernaum, Jesus is saying, my flesh, is, my, my, uh, my body is real food, my flesh is real food, and my, my blood is real drink. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have any share with me in my kingdom. And a lot of the disciples at that point said, whoa, this is way too of a bizarre teaching. We can't follow Jesus anymore. And a lot of people leave, if you remember. That happens in Capernaum. If you take Capernaum and turn it into uh, an adjective, you get Capernitic, I guess. And Capernitic understanding of the Lord's Supper is that when you are eating the wafer and drinking the wine, you are actually like chewing on Jesus's muscle and skin. Um, and when you drink the wine, you are actually drinking the same, the exact same blood that flowed from his side on the cross. It's almost a cannibalistic understanding. And that Capernitic or cannibalistic understanding is thoroughly denounced by, uh, by Catholics and by Lutherans and by other Christian groups. So when we go to the Lord's Supper, we don't think that we're getting a, a, piece, of, uh, uh, a piece of Jesus' skin, a piece of his muscle, okay? We understand that his body is present there in a, in a supernatural sense, a mystical sense, if you will. And Red Baradus at times sounds like that. And then at other times he sounds, he, he sounds very literal. So he's able to say the bread and the wine, they are literally changed. He uses the word, they're literally changed into the flesh and the blood of Jesus. They're transformed into that, essentially into those substances of our Lord, even though outwardly they, they still appear to be bread and wine to the senses. Now, Retromnus, uh, a few years later, is visited by uh, the, the grandson of Charlemagne, whose name was King Charles the Bald, even though I, I think I read he wasn't actually bald, so people don't really know why he was called King Charles the Bald. Um, but King Charles the Bald had read or had known about Red Berdus's argument, and he visited Corby, and I think he befriended Retramnus, and then he asked 
Retramnus for Retramnus's position on the Eucharist. So Retramnus, around the year 835, something like that, writes a treatise with the same title. I think the, the, the title of his of Riberus's book is The Lord's Body and Blood, and the title of Retramnus's work is also The Lord's Body and Blood. So uh, he writes, and it's kind of a rebuttal. It's kind of the mirror image of Ribertus. So uh, he, he flipped... Rodbertus will take stories from the Old Testament and the New Testament to prove that, to prove transubstantiation, and Retramnus will take those same stories and will show how transubstantiation is not actually happening. So Retramnus's position is that uh, outwardly, figuratively, there are certain things that Jesus Christ teaches or things that God works in his people uh, to kind of cover covers mystical truths with a veil to kind of obscure them from our, from our gaze, and that other times Jesus teaches or God the Father works miracles in a direct way uh, that is not ambiguous or mysterious at all. So, for example, Ritramna said, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Well, obviously that's not, that's, that's not literal. Uh, you, are, you are a person, you are not a part, of a part of a plant, okay? We understand that in a figurative sense as... Christ is our source, right? We are growing from him. We're growing into, into his body. We have a relationship to him. We, we depend on him for our existence, right? That's a figurative sense. And, but then Ritramna said, but it's not figurative to say that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he suffered and died on a cross, that he rose from the dead. None of that is figurative. That type of language is direct and is the direct presentation of the truth. Figurative veils the truth. Um, and we would say, as moderns with modern literary theory and everything behind, we would say the truth is veiled or the truth is obscured in order for us to work towards it and to, and to struggle with it and to hold it in tension, right? Um, although Retromnus doesn't really talk about that. Um, but he does talk about the figure and the difference between figure and truth. So for Retromnus, then, uh, what happens at the altar is something that is mystical, figurative, symbolic, okay? However, he does not fall into the error of then kind of just assuming that then what is happening in the Eucharist is not uh, for our salvation or is not for the forgiveness of sins. So he actually says the bread and the wine are symbols. They are veils of our Lord's body and blood. But our Lord's body and blood are really truly present. And we take and we eat our Lord's body and we drink his blood and he works in our, in our midst the forgiveness of his sins. Um, so there's kind of a, there's some from Retramnus that Lutherans borrowed, and, there, and then there's others that we, uh, we have rejected, because occasionally Retramnus sounds like he's advocating an inward spiritual understanding of the Lord's Supper only, kind of like what John Calvin advocated in the Reformation. So a spiritual understanding would be like this. Well, Jesus' body and blood are not actually here okay they're not physically here Jesus's body and blood are in heaven because he ascended into heaven however in a in a spiritual sense when we go up to the altar together and eat his bread and drink his blood we are in solidarity with him and he is working faith in our hearts and helping us to understand and trust in his sacrifice on the cross um, and forgiveness of sin and he maybe even communicates or grants to us forgiveness of sins in, in a sense uh, but what's actually present is not his body and blood, but outward signs of his body and blood. Retramnus occasionally sounds like that, which is a Calvinistic understanding. However, he also is able to say um, the word is, when Christ said, this is my body, is non-negotiable. When Jesus said, this is my body, that means for all time, when Christians go up and take the Lord's Supper, they are taking the true body and the true blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and something supernatural and mystical is happening. So you see the, kind of the difference there. At times it sounds like this is something inward and spiritual. At other times, Retramnus sounds a little bit more Lutheran, although Lutherans wouldn't be around for another you know, 700 years, 650 years. So that's the position, though. And what's interesting is that these two writers, they're, they're writing, well, Ribéris' writings exerted considerable influence in medieval thought. Retramnus's not so much. In the Reformation, they were both rediscovered, and then critical editions of their works were produced and printed in books. 
and then soon they were translated into German at some point, and then only later into English. Um, but to look at these views is to really look at kind of kind of every other view of the Lord's Supper, I would say, except for the view where that it's just um, that Christ doesn't actually forgive your sins in the Lord's Supper, that is completely a symbolic gesture or symbolic action. For Retramnus, though, the symbolism is important because certain Christians today believe that it's a symbolism that we have kind of, that Christ has given us and that we carry out. So, like, symbolically, we understand that the, that the bread is body and that the, that the wine is blood. Retramnus would say, no, no, this is a symbol that God grants. The symbol, just as Jesus teaches he's the vine and we're the branches, Jesus also is establishing this symbol, this veil, for an inward spiritual reality that we participate in and that we uh, enjoy together as Christians. Uh, very interesting. Both, both, uh, both men believe that it, is, that it is a sacrament, that it offers salvation and, salvation and forgiveness and grace, but they just understand it very differently. Uh, as we wrap up, I also want to say both of these men at this early time um, um, uh, advocated or believed in two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, just like Lutherans. So it was only later in the Middle Ages, in the 12th and 13th centuries, because of the teachings of Peter Lombard and other, other scholastic theologians, that seven sacraments were discovered uh, by Roman Catholics. At this time, still baptism and the Lord's Supper uh, were considered sacraments. Uh, I want to end with just a couple of interesting quotes, okay? I'll quote um, Rod Berdis first. So just to give you a taste of what he says. Um, let's see here. Um, Be assured, please, that the method resides in Christ's virtue, the knowledge and faith, the cause and power, but the effect and will, because the power of divinity over nature effectively works beyond the capacity of our reason. Therefore, let knowledge be held in the teaching of salvation, let faith be preserved in the mystery of truth, since in all these we walk by faith and not by sight. Interesting, isn't it? He says uh, we can't understand why the, the elements are physically changed into Christ's body and blood, but we can only accept that by faith. But notice that he says that physical change does occur, the transformation of the elements into Christ's body and blood, although outwardly they still appear to us to be, um, to be bread and wine. And then Retramnus, let's see here, under cover of the corporeal bread and of the corporeal wine, Christ's spiritual body and spiritual blood do exist. He says that in his writing. That could be interpreted in a couple of different ways, couldn't it? In a Lutheran sense, though, we say in, with, and under this bread and wine is the presence of the Lord's body and blood, and that's close to what Retramnus is saying, although it could be kind of... Um, kind of mis, mis, uh, misconstrued to mean that, so, that he's not actually present there, but that there's something spiritual going on in all of this. Anywho, uh, I have a handout uh, on lakeshoretheology.blogspot.com. Take a look at that. That will offer much needed uh, elucidation of all of this Eucharistic controversy. I hope you learned something, and God's peace to you, and we'll see you next week.